Thanks, Shalini. Good morning and welcome to all the delegates to the second day of the two day summit on future mobility jointly organized by CIA, SIAM and ECMA. The summit theme, as we know, is clean, which stands for connected, lean, electrified, alternate and noble mobility. So yesterday we had covered uh, uh, the first day that is yesterday we had covered three thematic sessions on connected mobility, lean mobility and alternate mobility. And we are very happy to inform all the delegates who are joining today that we were joined by senior government officials like Mr. Tarun Kapoor, Secretary, Minister of Petroleum and Natural Gas, Mr. Sudhendu Sina, Advisor, Niti Aayog, and senior industry leaders uh, like Dr. Pawan Goenka, Mr. C. V. Raman, and Mr. Nandan. Happy to also mention that we had more than 750 delegates joined in the yesterday's proceedings. So uh, thank you once again for an overwhelming response from from the from everyone. So today we have very <clears throat> two very important sessions that is electrified mobility followed by novel mobility. So let's begin the second day on session on electrified mobility with the theme electrification ecosystem. The panel is comprising of none other none other than CXOs of the auto industry to discuss, if I may say, a very hot topic on electrification. I would like to warmly welcome uh, Mr. Parikshit Luthra from CNC TV 18, a well-known journalist, and request him to introduce the panelists and take the discussion forward. I'm sure the session will make us sit back, relax, and enjoy the day of Saturday. Over to you, uh, please, Mr. Luthra. Thank you. Thank you so much, Saurabh. Very good to be here at this uh, at this convention. We're discussing the electrification ecosystem in India. Now, this is coming at a very interesting time. Uh, last year, there were major disruptions because of COVID-19, but uh, we have actually seen uh, an increase in adoption of electric vehicles across different categories. And in fact, the EV growth story will be different uh, across the world. We're also seeing companies like Jaguar Land Rover, uh, Ford, Skoda, uh, even Suzuki set ambitious targets as far as transition to electric vehicles. Jaguar has said that it will turn its entire electric, uh, uh, its entire fleet to electric by 2025. Land Rover, 60% electric by 2030. So those are ambitious targets for the European market as well. But if we speak about India, well, there is increasing awareness about electric vehicles. Uh, every month, we're hearing about more EV products in the two-wheeler space, in the three-wheeler space. Uh, in, uh, in in passenger vehicles in market. But uh, if we speak about F520, just before those lockdowns actually set in in India, uh, the number of EVs registered were about 1,70,000, 170,000. Uh, the EV penetration compared to internal combustion engines is just about 0.7% in India right now. But this is a sector that is definitely growing. While the center is creating enabling schemes for promoting electric vehicles and the union minister for road transport, Nitin Gadkari, is very clear that electric vehicles, hydrogen fuel cells, alternate fuel vehicles are the future. The adoption is going to be slow. Uh, the EV story has also been led very aggressively by various state governments who are making very attractive policies to increase adoption. They're also giving subsidies and uh, they're also trying to turn their fleet, the government fleet of vehicles to electric. But without wasting uh, any more time, I'm going to get in all the experts we have today, perhaps the best panel to tell us where we are heading with our electric vehicle growth story. We have Mr. Vijayanand, the CEO of the Amara Raja Group. He is setting up a, a lithium iron a manufacturing center. He'll tell us more about it in some time from now. We've got Avni Chha, head of EV infrastructure, charge and drive and sustainability at Fortum. We've got Nishant Arya, Executive Director, JBM, Mahesh Babu, MD and CEO, Mahindra Electric, uh, Dr. Ariel Liebman, Director, Monash Energy Institute and Chair of the Energy Research Institute, uh, Council of Australia, Tapan Sahu, Executive Vice President, Maruti Suzuki. And we also have with us uh, in uh, some time, probably, Mr. Anand Kulkarni, uh, Vice President, Product Line for the Electric Vehicle Business Unit at Tata Motors. Uh, I'd like to begin with Mr. Arya and Mahesh Babu. Uh, Mr. Babu, if I can ask you to just uh, talk about where we are with our EV ecosystem. We've had many conversations over the past three to four years. Uh, yes, there is a lot of excitement. We all know that we have to work very heavily towards electric vehicles. 
but the penetration still remains very, very low. How do you see this sector actually growing uh, in the next uh, five years? Thank you, Parikshit. I think uh, um, it was a very great introduction talking about Europe, what others are doing. I just want to reset India context before we get into adoption, what you talked about. See, India is not a car alone market. We have about only 4% of the four wheelers of the whole global uh, four wheeler fleet. Mm -hmm. India is a multimodal transport. You all know that 80% of the vehicles sold are three wheeler, two wheelers, and then we have three wheelers. Then uh, we have cars, we have buses, and uh, uh, rapidly we are seeing metro system and mass rapid transport. So adoption of cars, before I come, I need to look at we need to look at what's happening around other sectors. So let's look at uh, two-wheeler sector. Two-wheeler sector ecosystem development is much simpler and easier in India. Mm -hmm. uh, and you don't need uh, uh, high fast chargers, large fast chargers to handle it. Mm -hmm. uh, three-wheelers is very similar. Our experience with the Trio and the electric three-wheelers is very similar. People are simple charging at home and using it for 100 plus kilometers. And hence, uh, uh, the ecosystem can be contained towards uh, uh, limited areas and they don't depend on government uh, infrastructures. Car needs a uh, huge infrastructure development, which you have alluded to, and I'm sure many of them will talk about. Avdesh is here. We, I was told now we have about 1,000 charging stations and charge points across the country. Mm -hmm. So that's a great news, which is building up for the uh, uh, four-wheelers. And uh, and buses are captive use uh, ecosystem where uh, in the depots we can add charging and swapping and so on and so forth. So I would say that um, in the whole world, while we have ambitions of uh, electrification, India is not far behind. I would say in electrified mobility, it's we are just start of a start. Mm -hmm. uh, it's not even a start. So it's a very high opportunity for India to play. Mm -hmm. Uh, the very important thing is uh, government is playing a very important role in uh, policy making. Mm -hmm. Industry is uh, understanding the need and many of them, including uh, RIG and everybody are here who are investing in multiple uh, areas in India. Mm -hmm. and, uh, uh, and the right panel, which is right here, including Avdesh and the battery making, everything clearly says we have an industrial ecosystem supporting mm -hmm. the policy. Now, the biggest part, what the, both the policy and the industry needs to do is go and educate customers because we are trying to fit an electrified ecosystem into a fossil fuel ecosystem, which is not the right thing to do, according to me, because mm. we are talking about uh, charging stations like petrol pumps. Petrol mm. pumps came because you can't keep a com combustible fuel at home. Mm. But electricity is available at home and office and everywhere safely. So you mm. don't need uh, petrol uh, electric uh, charging stations like petrol pump. You need electric mm. charging stations at people where they spend time in malls, in uh, movie theaters, in uh, restaurants, in home, in office. So we mm. have to look at not adapting electric into the current ecosystem. We mm. have to look at how do we create a new efficient ecosystem for electric mobility. Mm -hmm. That's how I see, and I would say India is not far away. The gentleman and my colleagues who are experts here is a proof of India, how it is moving at a very right direction and mm -hmm. how it is getting contributed by all the ecosystem players, including the government, including industry. The mm -hmm. left out work is to go and create this ecosystem with consumers, build confidence in them, and then mm -hmm. say that we are going to stand next to it because I can tell you our first vehicle have crossed 2,50,000 kilometers already. Mm. I don't think any other vehicle in India has crossed and uh, happy to share that we uh, we never had a safety incident nor we had a battery life lower than 80% even now. So right. we have about uh, 200 vehicle crossed about 150,000 kilometers already and all of them are running without any issues. So. Uh, the proof of the pudding to the customer is uh, on the actual uh, experience. I think that's what we want to give it as an industry and the confidence level are slowly building up uh, with, uh, with the players. That's how I would say. Right. Uh, those are encouraging words, Mr. Babu. And I guess uh, India's EV growth story would be different from Europe and other places. Uh, possibly it will be driven by 
two wheelers and possibly even uh, three wheelers to some extent. In fact, if we go by data released by the Society of Manufacturers of Electric Vehicles, uh, in FI20, there were about 1,52,000 two-wheelers, electric two-wheelers that were sold in the Indian market. Uh, so that is a very, very big number. Uh, but let me go across to Mr. Nishant Arya right now. Mr. Arya, JBM is into component manufacturing, into electric buses, into public transport, setting up of uh, EV infrastructure, charging stations. Where do you think we are with our ecosystem right now? Because when it comes to electric vehicles, uh, it is still a technology that is at a nascent stage in India compared to the IC engine technology, which requires great investments, be it Mahindra Electric, be it Tata Motors, almost all the uh, major OEMs in India are looking for investments from outside. So where do you think we are with our electric vehicle ecosystem right now? So, Parisha, this is a very uh, important topic and uh, I think it is getting its due attention in India as we see in the past uh, few months, uh, especially mm -hmm. during COVID and before that. So I would look at ecosystem in two different perspectives. Uh, so the first perspective I would look at is the manufacturing ecosystem. So in mm -hmm. the manufacturing ecosystem, whether we look at different OEMs, uh, battery manufacturers, or key aggregates like power electronics, motors, then you talk about the uh, different uh, tier two, tier three manufacturers, the level of localization, and there's a clear roadmap which we see through PMP. It is acting as a right catalyst how companies can localize within a given, a given timeline. And I think uh, uh, so companies are taking plunge in different areas. Uh, OEMs definitely have their perspective depending on the segment they are in for the volumes they want to drive. And component manufacturers, from a traditional perspective, look for such kind of uh, volumes that based on that they can invest. And there's a clear roadmap, but I think uh, there is some clarity. There are st still multiple challenges there and uh, companies are looking to see how they can work because from the automotive industry in EV, other than the key EV aggregates and power electronics, alternate materials also play a very important role. Light weighting is extremely essential for electric vehicles. At the same time, a lot of testing and validation is being done and uh, for India as a market, a uh, lot of uh, vehicles can be brought to the market on a customized basis. So coming to the other ecosystem, so here there are multiple opportunities and I see that more and more players are now coming up with their solutions where mm. they are not looking at uh, solutions which are uh, purely from a manufacturing perspective, but manufacturing to TC or perspective total cost of ownership. When I talk about total cost of ownership, which is a genesis for electric vehicles, then we look at the operating ecosystem. In the operating mm -hmm. ecosystem, other than electric vehicles, we look at energy, we look at power infrastructure, charging infrastructure, funding, and the kind of government policy framework, which is so important to give a clear roadmap in terms of volumes and penetration. So I think uh, that is equally important. So how both uh, ecosystems run in parallel, I think that is what would define the market in India. And as you see in FAME, uh, the government has focused in a big way on asset utilization. And mm -hmm. uh, as we see in uh, primarily in buses and three wheelers, we have mm -hmm. the highest level of asset utilization and in the commercial two wheelers, which are used mm -hmm. for home delivery or any other commercial purposes and LCVs because the vehicle is running in case of buses about 200 to 250 kilometers a day. In case of three wheelers, I think Mahesh can add better, but I would say approximately 150, 120 to 150 kilometers a day, which is giving mm. the right level of asset utilization. And we are able to uh, see that uh, the vehicle is uh, knocking off a certain level of uh, CO2. The import bill is getting optimized as well as we are able to develop a, a ecosystem which is green and efficient. But in mm. the time uh, we are able to bring about certain mandates and we, the sector is getting priority funding. I think that is what would redefine this segment and a lot of awareness is required in all parts of the country. Mm. Charging infrastructure is also extremely important because in many cases people have range anxiety. In case of buses, we are able to do so in a better manner because we have depots and terminals already existing in different cities. And that mm. is why within FAME, the highest level of success attained until now is on buses. Out of 7,000, uh, more than mm. 5,000 uh, city buses have been allocated to different cities. And out of that, more than 50% have been tendered and allocated to different manufacturers and OEMs. Right. Mm. So, uh, but in other areas, definitely there are certain challenges and also there was impact due to COVID, I would say. But mm. what is important is that how we see holistically and see understand that 
uh, whether it is technologies of battery swapping or it is fast charging or slow charging, how it is impacting the end customer, how the range anxiety is getting addressed. We are talking about the second life of the batteries. So mm -hmm. in many cases, people design the batteries for the automotive application in the beginning. But if they can be designed for energy storage and application, then we are not talking about recycling until 15, 20 years. For the first mm -hmm. five to seven years, taking example of buses again, they can right. use in buses and next 13 to 15 years for energy storage. So mm -hmm. which uh, supports our solar initiative, also grid balancing, also and grid monitoring as well. And clearly right. how one can integrate the 450 gigawatts of uh, renewable energy should be added and taking it mm -hmm. by 2030 to EV. I think that is most important. But at the mm -hmm. end of it, what is another another point which comes to mind very clearly that we are not focused only on EV. EV is very mm -hmm. important and very essential, but eventually we are looking at all kind of alternate fuels like CNG and ICE will also coexist. So all three will coexist. And but depending on the application, depending on the geographic and demographic requirements, we will be mm. able to plug in the market and really move forward. So the perspective I want to bring about is that how companies are able to have a clear vision in terms mm. of their product, but more than product here, what is required is solution and experience because we have to handhold the customer in many ways to ensure there are no gaps. So that right. is what predefined. And to achieve this, how one has to focus on skilling and digitization to really see that uh, how uh, these things are being set right and not to repeat the same mistakes what we've done in the solar segment in the last 10 years where most of the things were getting imported and not manufactured locally. I think that is what would be a game changer to define and really have a sustainable EV ecosystem in times to come. And that's, that's important because when it comes to electric vehicles in India, we are still importing a large number of components which add to the cost of the vehicle as well. And that's what I'd like to uh, get in, Mr. Vijayanand. Mr. Vijayanand, uh, uh, Amara Raja Batteries is setting up a, a, up a lithium ion cell manufacturing plant. Uh, you have a partnership there with ISRO as well. Uh, the PLI scheme, which is allocating 18,000 crores for uh, cell manufacturing in India, they have a, a target of 50 gigawatt battery manufacturing plants in India. How important is this link? How important is for the Indian government, for Indian OEMs to invest in this sector if we want to make electric vehicles affordable for the common man? Uh, thank you, Parikshit. Uh, uh, you know, uh, this is a very uh, important. Happy to see my other co panelists. Uh, who probably make up the building blocks of solving the EV puzzle from the vehicle manufacturers to the charging infrastructure setup. And we believe that uh, there is creating domestic capability in the battery value chain. And probably that's where we try to evaluate, we try to understand what's the best roadmap that we can put in place. I want to take a step back here and look at the whole problem, uh, pull up the issue from two perspectives. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, am I audible? Uh, Mr. Vijayanand, you might like to repeat uh, what you were saying because we lost you in between. Okay. Uh, I was saying that uh, the issue need to be looked at from two perspectives. One is uh, the opportunity element of it in terms of demand for peace, how the e-mobility ecosystem will evolve. And uh, once we understand that, I think then the issue is to look at what challenges could be coming in the way to make it happen. And mm -hmm. how are we going to be relentless about the execution of these strategies? Mm -hmm. happening in US to be able to uh, solve our problems. I think we need India specific problems to solve India's uh, challenges. I call that as two things. One is the commute riddle and the other one is the logistics riddle. Luckily, in uh, this particular case, the Mr. Vijayanand, why don't we do one thing? Uh, I think we're having a little bit of a trouble with your uh... 
audio and video. Why don't you log in once again? Uh, we will take other panelists and we'll return to you as soon as possible because we're having some problem with your connection there. Uh, so we, maybe you can log in once again, disconnect and log in, and that might uh, sure, sure. better connectivity. Yeah. Sorry about that. Let me try again. No, no problem, sir. Uh, let me uh, get in Tapan. If Dr. Tapan Sahu is available right now, is he is he around? Yes, yes, he's here. Uh, you know, while uh, while Mr. Vijayanand gets back on uh, the link, uh, this is how you could also explain us about where Maruti is uh, going ahead when it comes to electric vehicles. You're very, you're betting very heavily when it comes to CNG technology, and Maruti has always been a firm believer in CNG and said that we, when we look at India's green future, we don't have to. Uh, only focus on electric vehicles. We we can focus on CNG uh, in a big way because there is a large penetration of CNG pumps across the country. Uh, do you still feel that an EV is will will be out of reach for the common man for the entry level car buyer for several years? Because there was an entry level electric vehicle, uh, a Wagoner variant that you have been testing for a long time now. It was slated it was slotted for a release for a launch last December uh, only for public transport, uh, but that did not happen. Maruti has delayed it right now. Where Where is Maruti when it comes to cars, entry-level electric vehicles for the basic consumer? Uh, thank you, Parikshit, for the question. It's a great question. Um, before coming to Maruti, I think uh, just like to share my perspective in terms of electric vehicle technology is a technology and it is a means to an end and it is not an end in itself. Mm -hmm. So we need to understand uh, the uh, both sides of the story in terms of what does India want mm -hmm. and uh, what does the consumer want, mm -hmm. both sides. Mm -hmm. So as a country, I think, uh, like you rightly said, you gave examples in your introductory remarks about how different countries are pushing electric vehicles and how different companies have announced their plans. Mm -hmm. And if you understand the genesis behind all this, mm -hmm. it is all about energy security and carbon neutrality you know the, these are the two driving factors so if you look at Indi india's energy security issue look at the consumption of uh, gasoline and diesel in various segments mm -hmm. then we need to look at how can we address this energy security at first uh, through various means mm -hmm. so it's not today but uh, since last 10 15, 10 years or so mm -hmm. that we, ha we have been betting big on cng because we feel that's one of the energy sources which is available in India and we can make it affordable for the consumers mm. and with the announcement of uh, government of India to increase the petrol uh, sorry CNG pumps from 1500 to 10,000 by 2030 mm. and uh, the expansion of the national grid mm. I think I, th I think that's is, that's uh, that is something which is a low hanging fruit which we are trying to take utilize utilization of. Consumers are very happy with the technology. It's a factory fitted CNG, safety, performance, durability, all aspects are taken mm. care of. Now coming to electric, mm. I think we believe in electrification and we started in a small way. Uh, I'd say small way because we started with the mild hybrid technology. We are betting big on the HEVs and EVs mm -hmm. coming. Uh, so as we progress uh, step by step, I think we are going to get into uh, HEVs and EVs, uh, strong hybrids, as well as the electric vehicle uh, technologies. It's going to take some time because uh, for the mass market, it's still not affordable as of today. So, say, I mean, we have to when you it. say it's going to take some time, what would be the time frame that you're looking uh, at? I'm sorry. I mean, I, I'm not here <laughs> to... <laughs> not for your launch, but when you're saying that, you know, uh, when an entry-level electric vehicle uh, would be more attractive to uh, the common buyer. It's going to take time. I think uh, if you look at uh, the announcement which Suzuki made uh, two days back about uh, uh, CO2 emissions and development and commercialization of hybrid and HEV EV vehicles, I think uh, the development of technology, uh, what has been indicated by Suzuki is uh, by 2025, develop all electrification technologies and uh, then full application to products and then increase the quantity that is expansion of into various portfolio. So that's the kind of time frame which the global outlook has given. I don't think I would be able to comment beyond that, but definitely be assured that 
we are working on both uh, hybrid and electric vehicle technology at the same time i have one more comment to make like we talked about the uh, you know ecosystem so if you look at the upstream and downstream uh, mm -hmm. value chain mm -hmm. i think what we believe is that uh, there has been uh, you know not too much of encouragement to the strong hybrid uh, vehicle technology whereas mm -hmm. if you look at the manufacturing ecosystem Mm -hmm. uh, the components which gets into the strong hybrid vehicle and an electric vehicle mm -hmm. are more or less similar mm -hmm. and to get those numbers uh, we need to encourage both technologies and we believe very 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 strongly and we have been pursuing with government and we continue to pursue that encouragement of hybrid vehicle technology is going to only accelerate tv it is not going to become a you know um, so called bottleneck for ev adoption but rather it is going to accelerate because the moment you are able to develop the manufacturing ecosystem you will be able to reduce cost and therefore make it more affordable right so you feel that uh, hybrid uh, vehicles are a step a great a big step towards greater adoption of electric vehicles in future uh, let me also get in mr avdesh ja right now uh, ja when it comes to electric vehicle infrastructure give us the sense of what kind of charging infrastructure we would need uh will we need a larger number of rapid chargers across national highways key roads in uh, major capitals uh major highways across the country to ensure that people can go ahead because uh, there there still is that range anxiety and even with vehicles which can give a high amount of range for example 400 vehicles uh, there will be that anxiety if you get stuck in a jam if uh, the range that you're left with is about 150 kilometers or 200 kilometers there is a worry that once you reach that level uh, the range starts falling very fast so how do we overcome that what kind of charging uh, stations do we need uh, to assure the customer that he need not need not worry if he's going out with a uh, with an ev uh, with low charge yeah thank you parikshit and i hope i am uh, audible you are sir excellent yeah so uh, before I come there, that what kind of infrastructure we should have, uh, I must disclose that I'll be talking about the four-wheeler segment and right. the passenger vehicle segment. I'll not be talking about two-wheelers and three-wheelers because that's not we are operating currently. Mm -hmm. So I'll start with you know what uh, Mahesh uh, said, you know the behavioral aspect because this is something as you uh, explained about the uh, if you are stuck in a traffic jam and then the battery draining very fast. Mm. I personally believe that this is something again, uh, kind of a misinformation because it doesn't, I mean, Mahesh is there and other OEMs are there. The battery doesn't drain so fast as we feel, you know, that mm. if you are stuck in a traffic jam. Uh, so I think these kind of misinformation, which is available currently prevalent in the minds of the consumer, that needs to be removed and that requires mm. consumer awareness. And, and it can start from the OEM, I would say the dealer level, the point of sale level, that the mm. US sell, because the dealers are, are also probably not very educated about this new technology. And we should be remembering that for last 100 years, we have been conditioned to use these ICE vehicles, you know, because mm. if you, you go, you know, uh, when the Ford uh, invented this uh, uh, Model T, e, at that mm. point of time also, the petrol was not so prevalent because in 19, 1908, the first oil field in Iran was discovered. And mm. by 1932, when it came to Bahrain and the, you know, Kuwait, this becomes the widely prevalent. Mm. So uh, what is important is that to understand these uh, technical aspects, because it's a highly technical mm. product, and the consumer need to be made aware about that one. Having said so, mm. I personally believe that the electric, when we talk about the electric vehicle, generally, currently we are discussing about only the battery electric vehicles. But whereas electric, it means it could be the fuel cell electric as well. And that is mm. also the future, you know, because mm. of uh, hydrogen coming from the solar through the electrolysis, that could be completely green. Mm. So when we're talking about the electric, my say is that it should be talking, you know, you should keep in mind that in the future, the fuel cell can also mature commercially mm. and that can uh, take over. But now mm. coming to the battery electric vehicle in the four wheeler segment, we believe that the consumer would be requiring uh, a, you know, some kind of a visibility on the street that yes, the charging infrastructure is there. As I have rightly said that the chargers can be installed at your home itself. You know, the 15 ampere socket can give deliver enough power overnight, which can mm. take you 100 to 150 kilometers. You need not be worried on that. But question is that 
does India have that the dedicated garage for everyone? I'm talking about the four wheelers. No? Mm -hmm. And this is the ultimate scenario. Initially, uh, during the initial adoptions, you will have the people because of the cost vehicles is slightly costlier. So people will be having a dedicated garage so they can afford to have those dedicated charging points as well. But as it becomes a mainstream vehicle in 10 years, 15 years time, because we should look forward from that point of view, then you will be probably requiring more chargers at the common place. And that could be destinations. It could be shopping mall. It could be municipal corporation parking. It could be petrol station and along the highways. Mm. I personally believe that the, whenever the charger has to be in the public place, people would prefer to have the fast charger because mm. we are living in a time when we do not have the, uh, you know, pacing, you know, do not have the patience for waiting at one particular point for one hour or two hours. Mm. So it will be in public places. It has to be primarily the fast chargers. And mm. currently the fast charger, you know, in India, we have a two segment of vehicles. Mm. One segment is the low power vehicles, another is the high power vehicles where you require a 400, uh, you know, kind of a volt systems. Mm. So for that, you have a minimum 50 kilowatt chargers requirement. Mm. And for a low power, you require a minimum 15 to 20 kilowatt of power chargers in the public locations. Mm. And that give you, you know, uh, we, we are talking about that, whether the individuals are adopting the vehicles or not in the four wheeler segment. Mm. Our analysis says, you know, because we have been operating for last two and a half years and primarily in Hyderabad, where we have almost more than 60 charging points. Our analysis says that the, our revenue is coming 50, 50 percent from the individual as well as from the fleet. So 50 percent mm. is coming from the fleet and 50 percent is coming from the individual. So it, it belies this myth that this is being adopted only by the fleet. Individuals mm. are equally adopting it. And mm. thanks to the government's policies where they have given the you know, reasonable subsidies, I would say, you have, they have given the exemption in the income tax. And mm. some of the states have also removed this road and registration taxes. So practically then you are bringing down the overall upfront cost. An interesting mm. part is that on the, you know, ownership basis, because the cost of operation is one rupees, one and a half rupees per kilometer, which is much less than, you know, five or six rupees in the petrol variant, because I believe strongly that diesel variant is gradually will be phased out and petrol would be the main dominant in the ICE vehicle. So I think the fast charger would be the in the public locations and the semi slow chargers like, you know, 15 kilowatt or 14 kilowatt type two AC, that would be the slow charger at the destination locations like the uh, shopping malls or the office or the workplaces. So these would be the format of the charging infrastructure. Right, that will be the format. Uh, thank you so much, uh, Mr. Abdesh. Those were, those were great insights. I'm going to come back to you uh, in a short while, but let me get in, uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Dr. Ariel. Dr. Ariel, I'm sorry to keep you waiting. We wanted to get a larger picture from you, and I wanted to cover all the guests before we put that larger picture. Now, while we speak about India's growth story, and it will be possibly different from other countries, what do you think has worked globally when it comes to creating the right ecosystem, encouraging greater adoption of electric vehicles? So what do you think has worked globally uh, in Europe and in other places? Well, thank you, and uh, yeah, pleasure to be here. Uh, can you hear me okay? Very well. Very well, okay. Well, first of all, I might just um, say that I'm mostly can really comment on, on the Australian context at the moment, um, the, but the global sure. context sure. is, I uh, can also talk about it. And, and secondly, I'd like to say, well, why do we want electric vehicles anyway? Or why, why do people want electric vehicles? It's worth always asking why before you go into the how and, and, and start changing the world. Uh, if it turns out that it wasn't necessarily what you actually wanted, <laughs> uh, the, the outcome. So, so I think, well, we, we do want uh, electric vehicles, both, both uh, policy makers around the world and, and consumers want them. And why do they want them? Well, in, in some cases, in many cases, it's around emission reduction um, and it's becoming more and more urgent. Uh, as you all know, um, we have uh, some, some pretty significant climate targets globally to meet. If we are having to avoid a 1.5 degree uh, warming, which seems to be the the minimum, or you know, that we need to do to be able to avoid dangerous climate change. We need to reduce global greenhouse gas emissions by uh, fifty percent by twenty thirty, maybe around eighty percent by twenty forty, and then one hundred percent by twenty fifty. So the twenty fifty net zero target is a little bit of a um, what we call in Australia a furphy. It's it's a phantom. We should be worrying about the twenty thirty and, and, and twenty forty trajectory. And so that's really mm -hmm. urgent, right? So EVs are, are, and transport in general is a major source of um, emissions. 
Um, and um, so, so and for certain countries, which probably most countries are not uh, very rich in oil reserves, Australia certainly uh, is a major oil exporter, importer, and also uh, more and more becoming an importer of, of refined oil, not just you know, our refineries are closing because they're becoming uneconomic. So energy security is a major problem. And, and uh, together with being maybe nearly at the end of the fuel supply chain, like uh, Australia and New Zealand, our, our petrol is relatively expensive compared to other uh, OECD countries uh, like the US. I mean, Europe's got major taxes, of course, but you know, costs are, are significant. So, so um, in order to um, you know, tackle the opportunity of uh, rolling out EVs, I think the, and I think everybody probably at this table, virtual table knows this, uh, that the, the policies that really seem to work well, it's incentives um, to buy vehicles privately, private uh, purchases through tax concessions, um, rebates, and, and all sorts of things like that. It really re seems to require very significant uh, government intervention um, because we, we really haven't um, reached the point where we have um, uh, sufficient parity between the cost of uh, ICE vehicles and uh, electric vehicles. And uh, interestingly, in Australia, we don't really have any significant policies to that effect. So Australia is very far behind in the EV uptake. Uh, I, I don't know the exact sort of uh, uh, relativity to India, but uh, my guess is India might even be ahead of Australia, even though what you were saying was that you were at the start of the curve as well. Um, uh, and then, so, uh, so incentives and then industry development incentives are required by government too. You know, n nobody can create a new tran uh, transformation into new infrastructure without strong government support. It's a little bit like trying to uh, build the original large-scale electricity grids uh, completely privately. Almost every country in the world, this was a, a big government initiative. So, um, uh, yeah, I think there there is a, a lot of uh, evidence and a lot of uh, good arguments for uh, governments providing the incentives, both on the uptake side, market pool, pool let's say, and then the market push, developing, supporting the development of these technology. So, and uh, mm -hmm. I'm not an expert on the Indian policy landscape, but I think India seems to be doing reasonably well at this. I think uh, in Australia, I, think I would hope we can learn a bit from India on that uh, front. So, yeah, thank you. So interesting, uh, uh, Dr. Ariel, that uh, you're telling us that uh, this is a sector that will have to be supported by the government through subsidies for buyers, subsidies for EV manufacturers, maybe subsidies for setting up charging infrastructure, and generally an enabling ecosystem. Because it's a nascent technology, we also don't know where it's going. Uh, another thing that I'd like to ask you, uh, Dr. Ariel, and you, you could possibly tell us from the Australia example, uh, what is Australia betting on for the future? We're talking a lot about lithium-ion cell right now in electric vehicles. But then, if you look at the example of Jaguar Land Rover, they have recently announced that when they make a full transition to green vehicles, their fleet would be a mix of uh, hydrogen fuel cell and electric fuel cell. Now, there are so many technologies which have been tested for the future. How does an OEM, how does a component manufacturer know where to put his money? So. What is the Australian example? How is it working towards its green transition? What technologies are you betting on for future? So uh, that's a very good question. So uh, I'm not sure what, uh, the, what, what who Australia really is when you ask this question, because we have the Australian government, we have state and federal governments who have very different ideas about often, uh, even if they're from the same uh, side of politics, they have different ideas about what's important in the energy landscape. Uh, it's a little bit of a, a shambles in some ways, uh, the, the Australian energy landscape. Uh, those of you who do watch the Australian energy policy uh, landscape, uh, know it's been very turbulent. And uh, and so the, it, it, we have to look at maybe what's happening on the ground. On the ground, I think um, people, the, the, the consumers, are very well aware that EVs are coming. Everybody's talking about them. But not many people are buying them. You know, they, they look at the market once in a while and they go, oh, that's a bit too expensive. I can't really afford that. And then they end up buying either a, a, a hybrid uh, electric vehicle or most likely just a, in a, in a, an efficient uh, petrol vehicle. And um, we, we have uh, state governments who are looking at, um, they're encouraging it in a very high level, but not putting a lot of money behind it. And uh, the federal government has just released uh, 
uh, a uh, policy for EVs, but it, it's not a very um, strong policy. But it does recognize, uh, Australia does uh, collectively recognize that EVs are coming in, in, in various uh, ways. And um, mm -hmm. uh, so and consumers are there. So I think that the market is, is there for EVs in, in the future. Certainly the, some of the organizations that I'm involved in uh, research and development organizations, one of them, the um, Reliable, Affordable, Clean Energy for 2030 Cooperative Research Center, where I lead a research program, national research program on um, uh, electricity networks. One of the themes is electric vehicles in the grid. That's a very high priority theme, and we, we're seeing more and more interest in that. And that grew even in the last year since the um, center was launched. On the other hand, um, sometimes you may have heard about Australia's um, uh, bet on hydrogen. Mm. And um, uh, and uh, so hydrogen is seeming like uh, it's going to be uh, very important in Australia. And there's a lot of government money behind um, hydrogen. There is some government money behind R&D in the grid integration aspects of electric vehicles through the Australian uh, Renewable Energy Agency. So there is some money on that side. But on the hydrogen side, there is, there's a lot of excitement. I think um, it fits in with the current um, political um, alignment of the government because it mm. looks a little bit like a resource, a fossil fuel in the sense that you you store it, it's kind of a liquid or a gas, and you can put it on a ship maybe one day and then or in some form and export it. And Australia is a resource energy resource and particularly exporter from this perspective. And so yeah. hydrogen yeah. Is, is very uh, showing a lot of excitement here. But uh, you know, the, my personal view is that, that hydrogen at scale um, from for storage and trans from a storage and transport uh, uh, technology perspective, is still maybe ten years away before it's really commercially uh, uh, viable. So whereas EVs, you know, they're ready to go now with the right government policies. You know, somebody could flip the switch in the government and say, hey, actually, we want to encourage that. So you know, the OEMs will need to be ready to come. You know, next year maybe, right? You know, anything like that can can happen. So yeah. um, and the other um thing that's probably different for Australia uh, uh, compared to say India or many other countries is we see hydrogen in particular as a as a way of exporting renewable energy in liquid form. So uh, there's a lot of uh, uh, interest and, and some investment in electrolysis technologies or at least understanding the pathways. We already know we can build an electrolyzer everywhere in the world. So how do we do this at scale uh, next to large wind and solar farms and then put it in um, into storage, probably in the form of ammonia rather than liquid hydrogen, and then export it around the world to China, in, uh, India maybe, or um, uh, Japan. Japan seems to be a, a very um, strong target. And even um, uh, Germany has expressed interest in importing hydrogen from Australia. Now that tells you that hydrogen can have a dual purpose as well as being a major export of of raw energy, it's also then there and available for fuel cell electric vehicles. So, um, but, but I think it's 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 a way too early to make a bet on fuel cell electric vehicles for Australia just yet. So, if you're an OEM, I think you can. It's a safe bet that there will be more electric vehicles in Australia over the next five years and certainly in ten years. Um, uh, and but it's unclear where this the whole fuel cell hydrogen electric vehicle. Uh, horizon start of that horizon is right uh, thank you uh, dr Arya, for all those views and the australian example we're going to come back to you in a bit uh but uh, mr vijayanand if i can get you in now uh sorry for all that trouble initially uh you were telling us about your outlook when it comes to lithium iron cell manufacturing in india very important uh component in the entire uh ev chain when it comes to the indian example uh do you think we're focusing enough on making battery manufacturing cheaper? Uh, because this is a critical component. It contributes heavily to the cost of manufacturing and acquisition of an electric vehicle. Mr. Bajan, I have a question to you. Uh, thank you, Parikshit, and thanks for putting up with that earlier problem. Uh, I've been advised to keep my video off in case if my bandwidth continues to be challenging. So uh, am I audible now? Very well, sir. Okay, thank you. Uh, I think uh, uh, there have been significant discussion on multiple aspects of uh, e-mobility and adoption of electric uh, vehicles in the country and uh, what could potentially be the challenges. Uh, one of the things that we need to focus 
very clearly as India is looking at the supply chain associated with the various CV components. And if you were to do a Pareto both in terms of volume and technology complexity, uh, the battery and battery related systems are right up there. Uh, they constitute anywhere between 40 to 60 percent of the final vehicle value. Uh, uh, you know, as we speak today in terms of the readiness of the domestic market to adopt aggressive supply chain uh, capability building on the battery side in India, uh, the, the the government is very focused. The advanced cell chemistry initiative that government has taken is primarily to create that basic minimum capacity up to 50 megawatt, megawatt to 50 gigawatt hour. Uh, because mm -hmm. if you look at the global uh, scenario, uh, China mm -hmm. has taken a significant lead. It, uh, it has about two thirds of the world capacity in terms of the uh, cell manufacturing, 80-85% capacity of the active materials that go into the cell. And mm -hmm. uh, the, you know, the, the Europe is now kicking al alive. There are plans announced for uh, over the next five to 10 years, another 400 to 500 gigawatt hours of uh, capacity addition being done there. The 2030 estimates globally cross uh, two uh, uh, trillion watt hours there. Uh, you know, th this uh, this would mean India has to increase its effort, and uh, the ACC PLI scheme of government at 50 gigawatt hour would set the initial strength required for the domestic uh, capability. But that won't be enough. I think it's just to handhold when you are in there. You know, taking baby steps on this. Uh, the, today, globally, uh, anywhere between 10 to 12 gigawatt hour is seen as a competitive scale for a single location manufacturing. And some of the announcements that you hear from uh, Europe are to be in the tune of the 30 to 45, 60 kind of gigawatt hour uh, capacities are being talked about by various manufacturers. So how are we going to get there? Uh, mm. When I look at the demand versus the supply uh, equation in India, I think uh, there are multiple numbers available, but uh, slowly I see convergence uh, around by 2025, maybe the country needs about 30 to 40 gigawatt hours of battery supply requirements. And by mm -hmm. 2030, if things happen right, we may cross mm -hmm. 100 gigawatt hour and even touch 150 gigawatt hour. Now, mm -hmm. how are we going to get that kind of a capacity? The thumb rule is that you need at least a billion dollar investment to set up the 10 to 12 gigawatt hour as a global scale facility, which means we need at least four to $5 billion of investment going into this. So one challenge of setting up that uh, uh, battery supply chain is to make those significant investments. And uh, the second challenge is to keep track of both the technology and cost curve. That's not mm -hmm. static. I mean, there is a lot of dynamics happening there. Mm -hmm. uh, people have heard about how dollars per kilowatt hour is changing dramatically and mm -hmm. following that, uh, you know, the exponential drop. Uh, there are predictions being made that at cell level, the cost would come down to below $80 per kilowatt hour. Now, uh, we are probably, you know, uh, looking at even if somebody were to think of setting up a 5 gigawatt or 8 gigawatt or facility, uh, we would be, uh, you know, finding it challenging to even touch 110, 120 dollars per kilowatt or kind of cost. But as I said, you can't stop there. You got to look at setting up, you know, larger facilities. So tracking the energy density, performance characteristics of the cell, and the, uh, you know, the cost curve are critical. There are two things that the industry need to do here. One is make sure that you have the reach to the global technology players, mm -hmm. ensure that you are able to access the technology as a startup, because I can't think of doing a ground up kind of a research here to get into that uh, curve. But mm -hmm. as you adopt, as you bring in those technologies, mm -hmm. build the domestic research capability to go through the cost curve and technology curve. Today, people talk about 200, 250, uh, you know, whatever per kg kind of energy density. But uh, the, the, you know, what predictions are that it may go even up to 350 to 400 in a five to seven year period. And if solid state uh, batteries kick in, you might mm. want to even look at much bigger uh, energy density numbers there. So mm. that I think is the industry challenge that you have to make those initial investments to get to a reasonable scale of manufacturing to start with but then mm. parallelly work on building capability to track the technology and cost curve. And I think this is where I do agree with the Dr. Tapan Sahu when he says, while there is certain segment of vehicles that could be pure electric vehicles, 
at mm. least particularly the passenger vehicle, you got to leave the vehicle technology agnostic and that the government should probably put in efforts to see that even hybrid vehicles do make inroads into the market because you have to add up all of that to be able to create the demand required for the entire supply chain, including batteries, to be able to scale up and scale up in the right direction. Right. Uh, those are those are very uh, interesting words there, uh, Mr. Vijayanand. But if I can, uh, if I can also ask you uh, now, this was a question that we also put to Dr. Ariel, and he was telling about telling us about the hydrogen fuel cell example of Australia. Now, as someone who's investing and looking to invest big in lithium-ion cell manufacturing, uh, how are you going about allocating? For your R and D, when it comes to different fuel technologies that are aware that are there globally, do you think somewhere the Indian government needs to also put in money into R and D uh, and somehow show the future? Because yes, right now we might be focusing on electric vehicles, hybrid vehicles, but there are different alternate fuels available in the market globally. So what might be more popular in ten years from now, fifteen years from now? Do you think we need to work with a with a long-term roadmap, do you see that long-term roadmap? I know Mr. Gadkari speaks about alternate fuels everywhere in every seminar, but do you, do you see the industry having a clear roadmap on where it's going? Uh, Pariksha, I think this is a very important question, and that's something that uh, you know you write in the elephant in the room kind of a thing for us when we talk on maybe strategy decisions, uh, mm -hmm. not just in our own corporation, but I'm sure that's true with many people who want to put this investments. But let's look at the global scenario. Hmm. If I were to look at the total amount of dollars being spent in the electrification of uh, mobility, hmm. uh, I would say that today, both on the research and on the uh, you know commercial operations, uh, probably 70% of the money is going in there into lithium and lithium-based chemistries. Hmm. Now, that means there is a significant scale and capability and maturity curve that many organizations are trying to go through on the lithium side. And I believe that trend is likely to continue for the next 10 years at least. Because, uh, you know, uh, uh, you, you are putting in huge amount of infrastructure. You are mm. creating large capabilities in the entire supply chain. And uh, it's not easy to undo that as much as we are trying to do, adopt various new technologies. Mm. But I think the uh, smart thing is to do, uh, you know, keep a watch on what are the likely alternatives coming in. Personally, mm -hmm. I believe hydrogen is a little too far. Hydrogen might find its application, techno-commercially viable in some niche applications, stationary mm -hmm. applications, uh, mm -hmm. you know, uh, energy storage applications. But on mobility applications, it's going to be quite some time before hydrogen becomes a commonplace mm -hmm. as an alternative. Uh, mm -hmm. But uh, even if you were to look at the electrochemistry of batteries itself, I think mm -hmm. you've got to have very, uh, a significant amount of uh, new innovations being talked about. For example, mm -hmm. today within the lithium family, 811 or 9555 chemistries are the mm -hmm. ones that are seen to be taking the center stage over the next five to seven years. Then mm -hmm. we're talking about anode materials going through a significant change. So, you know, if you look at the canvas or landscape, even before you move away from lithium to hydrogen or some other exotic uh, technology, even within lithium family, even within the uh, you know, alternatives available, it's mm. very important for organizations like us or anybody else trying to put money behind that to be able to keep a little bit of fungibility on the of the assets, but oh. at the same time collaborate effectively with the various academic institutions, the startup ecosystem that's there in India, outside India, mm. and also look at the other global technology uh, resources to be oh. able to stay at the uh, you know front end of the technology curve. So that's an important aspect. Otherwise. By the time you gain scale, probably mm. you are already a second generation, third, third generation technology. And mm. that's not what you want to do. Right, right. Uh, very interesting there. Uh, Mr. Arya, if I can uh, get you in. Uh, I was listening to Mr. Gadkari recently at the Aqua Summit. Uh, and he said that we have achieved 70% localization in India when it comes to component manufacturing by turning the combustion engines. He's encouraging the industry to move to 100% localization. Now, if I ask you about the EV ecosystem specifically, what would be the level of localization for manufacturing those components? 
Oh, that's a, that's a very important question. Uh, it's not really in my area of expertise. I, I focus on the integration uh, of, of uh, EVs into the energy system, the grid, and, and, and uh, this is a kind of a microeconomic, macroeconomic policy issue. Uh, uh, I mean, what I would say, what is your uh, objective function from an optimization language? What are you trying to um, uh, maximize uh, for? I mean, I'm sure it's not 100%. I don't see why, you know, I mean, maybe for a country like India, 100% is good because you're large, you have diverse manufacturing. Um, I, I, if I was off, you know, from a more naive perspective, I would say for a country like India, who's a major manufacturer of a lot of technologies, I would try and get as close to 100% because then you've got ability to export every part of uh, the um, supply chain. You've got the ability to, to be resilient to external shocks when um, if supply interruptions happen in that currently missing 30%. And uh, that's important if you're really on a very steep and um, uh, uptake pathway for renewables domestically. So, and then you got, you know, component supply security. So uh, you know, some, some shock to the um, external ecosystem doesn't uh, uh, then affect you as much. So yeah, that, that, that's uh, what I can think. Okay, thank you, uh, Dr. Ariel. That actually, I was putting that question to Nishant Arya. I called him Dr. Arya. That's my mistake. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I'm sorry. Uh, but Nishant, if I can uh, put that question to you, what is our level of localization when it comes to manufacturing? Sure. Uh, so actually, uh, if we could all just mute when we are not speaking, that would be great because otherwise there's an echo. So. Uh, uh, my only point here is that, you know, uh, still we are always in the transition process. Uh, uh, we as a company today try and see that we import almost nothing other than cells, uh, battery cells, and we have tried to localize everything in India. But uh, at a tier two, tier three level, tier four level, I think there is a lot more which needs to be done. A lot of uh, chips and power electronic items do get imported into India. Uh, but in due course of time, I see that many low global manufacturers are coming to India as the scale is increasing and as they see a clear roadmap of manufacturing. So definitely we would see a big change. But if I say where we were two years back, I think for in the last two years, there has been a significant change in the amount of localization. And uh, in the mechanical side, already India was there on the electronic and electrical side. We have covered a lot of distance and especially mm -hmm. on the battery side, many companies uh, have localize the BMS and few other items, but uh, cell manufacturing needs a humongous scale. And uh, as my other fellow colleagues were talking that uh, definitely um, with the PLI scheme, uh, a lot of companies would be looking to set up battery facilities in India for manufacturing battery packs and cells. Right. Uh, Mr. Mr. Tapan and uh, Mr. Babu, I'll get you in now on the FAME scheme. FAME 2 was an improvement on FAME 1. Yeah, there was a bit of criticism on FAME 1 that it was encouraging uh, low-powered vehicles. Uh, that has been done down way with FAME 2, and we've seen a, a greater adoption. Uh, in, in fact, even in the last year, which was the COVID year, we've seen, a, we've seen a large number of electric vehicles being supported by the FAME 2 scheme. But going forward, Mr. Sahu, if I can ask you that question, what would you expect from FAME 3? Uh, right now, we've not heard anything from the government. Uh, on that, I'm sure there are consultations going on inside. But when it comes to the next set of incentives for uh, for electric vehicles, what would you be looking for? What do you think is now important as a next step, Mr. Sahu? No, I think um, um, as a next step, uh, first of all, the policy continuation and stability of the policy is very, very important for the industry to invest. Same too had put a lot of conditions. If you look at it, when we have our discussions within Sam along with my and other people, a lot of conditions on PMP and localization aspects. Um, so a graded uh, localization improvement mm. and encouragement to localization is one thing that will be looked at on the uh, supply side. On the consumer side, how do we really look at creating awareness, which was part of the scheme? Uh, it's something that we'll be looking at. We'll be definitely looking at kind of support to hybrid vehicles mm -hmm. and also at the same time uh, more, more encouragement to newer and newer technologies for R&D. These are the two, three pointers from my side. I'd uh, request one is to comment more on this. Yeah, Mr. Babu, uh, this will be very, very important uh, for the industry for greater adoption. 
What would be your view on this? I agree with Tapan. I think uh, we should not now too much tweak the policies uh, uh, so that it became unstable. I think uh, I have been saying that uh, central governments, state governments have done enough on EV and now it is the time to implement them on the ground rather than now picking the policy. So if FAME 2 is extended, let's say for a stable three to five years, I mm. think it gives a clear confidence to the industry that the direction is clear. We need to continue to work on it. It gives mm. also a clarity to the uh, battery manufacturers because battery manufacturers need volume and they need a stable demand, uh, demand uh, from the industry. So mm. I would say that we should not make any more policies for one or two years. It should be a five-year policy. It should be a 10-year direction vision uh, we are talking about. So I think it's very, very important. Why I'm saying this is even if we talk about hybrid, even we talk about, uh, let's say, hydrogen fuel cell, basically mm. we need batteries. Mm. Basically we need motors. Basically we need drives which are very, very important. Mm -hmm. And if we have a clear direction, let's say by 2030, we want uh, uh, so much adoption. I think it is very important that we work towards it. Mm -hmm. Policy is not going to now make adoption. I strongly believe now the industry and consumer awareness, what we are talking about, uh, is mm -hmm. the two things which, uh, which, uh, which is going to change. Maybe I will take this opportunity on the two myths which uh, Parikshit, you typically ask, you are not asked. So I will ask myself and give the clarity. What mm -hmm. will happen on import? Instead of importing oil, do we import lithium and cobalt? Is your typical uh, critic question, yes. and then they say uh, nothing is going to happen. So mm -hmm. I want to just clarify again: oil is not equivalent to lithium and cobalt. So just to do a calculation, we took a life of two lakh kilometers of a vehicle and found about you will import four thousand eight hundred dollars to five thousand dollars of uh, import through its life cycle for two lakh kilometers on a vehicle for oil. Mm -hmm. But if you just import lithium and cobalt, which I believe is a short term, you mm -hmm. will import only $1,000 worth of import to that uh, 2 lakh life cycle on a car. So it's a substantial difference. You will just reduce 75% of your import bill. So that means if you have $100 billion of import today, it's going mm -hmm. to just come to $25 billion. It's a substantial. That's the, that's the import uh, export gap India has, more than the import export gap India has. Mm -hmm. So... So the lobby and critics say that the import of oil is going to be replaced by import of lithium and cobalt is not true. Mm -hmm. Second, I strongly believe India doesn't have mines. Uh, we don't have lithium and cobalt uh, or let's say nickel. One, mm -hmm. we have urban mining. All mm -hmm. your mobiles, all our mobiles have lithium, cobalt and nickel. So mm -hmm. if all your batteries in three years or four years is going to get like end of life and these batteries come for recycling, maybe Vijayanandra may add to it, that we have a huge amount of recycled lithium, cobalt and nickel available in urban mining in India because we are one of the largest uh, mobile users in the country, in the world. So mm -hmm. there is a huge possibility of that replacing. The second big myth with uh, which I think uh, Avesh Jha was trying to tell you is about the need for infrastructure. I strongly believe that it's an overrated statement. Mm. The lobbies which say electric is not the right one to adopt. Mm. Let me give two scenarios of examples, okay? In the city, in Delhi, Bangalore, Mumbai, Chennai, you take any city in India, the average speed of any person traveling cannot be more than 15 km an hour. Okay, mm. if that is the reality, maybe 15 to 20, let's be let it frank between the cities. If that mm. is the reality, how much range you need for a vehicle to run in a city? Mm. Even if you have 200 kilo, 100 kilometers, let's say range, it's going to take more than five hours for you to use full capacity. Mm. Even so, so why you need more than 200 kilometer range? Why you need more than 150 kilometer range when you're running in a city? where the average mm. speed is 15 kilometers. So you are not going to drive, you and me, Parikshita, cannot drive more than five hours in a city. The fatigue will take you out to forget the range. Mm. So you will definitely stop for charging. You will definitely stop for eating or you will definitely stop for a coffee where you can charge it. So this is another myth. Customers are being scared always to adapt electric mobility. Is 200 kilometer range is not sufficient. Mm. So let's take city to city. I'm driving from Bangalore to Chennai. 
even if you take that city to city, the average speed is 50 kilometers. So if you have a 250 kilometer range, still you are going to have a five hour drive. You are, can you drive five hour in a city, in a highway? No, you, after two, two and a half hours, you will take a break for mm -hmm. either breakfast, lunch or coffee. So half an hour is sufficient to charge you back. So there mm -hmm. is a huge myth of this, what I would say, uh, lobby telling that you need substantial infrastructure for charging and then then that uh, do so i i think education of the customers practical use demonstration mm -hmm. the more vehicles on the road will give a lot of confidence to the customers i think these two myths are very important one is the important myth of oil versus lithium and cobalt and another is then huge need of uh, um, infrastructure which we are talking is practically not the need they may be overrated as i always say right no, uh, Mr. Babu, you raised that very important point, and I'm happy you spoke about uh, uh, the the cost of lithium ion imports uh, and comparing them to the import bill as far as fuel or, or as far as oil is concerned, because this is the big concern of the government. We want to reduce our fuel import bill, and that's why we want to encourage green technology uh, and uh, you know reduce uh, expenditures that way. But if I may ask you, I think last year I was hearing uh, Dr. Pavan Goika. And Dr. Goenka had said in response to a question that greater adoption of electric vehicles for personal use is still some time away. And Mahindra for at least two years would like to focus on the public transport segment when it comes to greater adoption of electric vehicles. Now, uh, this was a question that I was trying to uh, put to Tapan as well. What do you think will have to be uh, the average cost of an electric vehicle and the range that it gives for it to be a, attractive to a common buyer to say that no i will not buy an ic engine uh, i see great value in an electric vehicle and i'll go ahead and buy that there are options available in the market right now uh, but those would be in the range of uh, yes mahindra has vehicles uh, under uh, under 10 lakhs but then if you look at the zs ev or uh, the kona they would be in the range of 15 to about uh, 23 lakhs. So what would be the the sum that would make it attractive, uh, the cost that would make it attractive to a common man? Uh, Tapan, you want to go first? My, my, please go ahead. I'll just come up. Okay, Parishit, I think uh, uh, you have raised a very important point. I will talk about economic viability mm. and social responsibility as two different things because both of them play a vital role in it. So if you look at economic viability, that's why I said three wheelers make economic viability today with the cost of batteries and the cost of price and the fame to come together, all three come together. If the fame through continue, fame to continue to be where it is, the cost of battery where it is and the price of the vehicle, which we are doing, mm. it makes economic sense today. But that means the customer who are buying a trio, let's say three wheeler is able to earn three to 6,000 rupees based on whether they drive 100 or 150 kilometers a mm. day, which is very important at the bottom of the pyramid of the people. I hear women drivers adopting electric mobility in three wheelers because it's drive by wire, there is no clutch and all them. And they say that if three to 6,000 they earn a month extra because of the lower operating cost, they actually educate their second child, which is a very profound impact in the society in the country. Hmm. So that is very important to have a social impact by a technology. All technology is sitting here. If, if it has a social impact, it has some more important satisfaction to doctors and technicians and businessmen rather than just bringing some technology. So three wheelers is an economically viable one. Hmm. Two wheelers is not economical in personal use because they run very low, but it's a most important need of the country because 80% of the vehicles sold in the country are two wheelers and hence it has an uh, impact on the nation and they consume a lot of fuel because 80% of the vehicle running in and they need it. Then mm -hmm. come to um, uh, four wheelers, which Dr. Goenka has talked about, the nation and the, and the society needs to reduce pollution and oil import and hence fleets are the one which are needs to be uh, taken care of mm. and hence uh, uh, the focus we did uh, is on fleet vehicles 10 lakhs 10 less than 10 lakhs vehicle which make economic viability and we proved that mm. uh, the fleet vehicles are economically viable in india 
the fleet customers started buying in large numbers. Unfortunately, due to COVID, that segment is under uh, tremendous stress. But it will come back when the COVID goes and the normalcy returns. Mm. Uh, uh, the fourth segment is the one which you are talking about, Parikshit. How much would be the break-even between ICE and uh, ICE and EV vehicle? This is a very important question, particularly in personal use, and it has different segment. It has a small car segment, it has a, a C and D segment, and you have a higher segment than C and D. Let's say SUVs, small SUVs, compact SUVs, and higher SUVs. Mm. Now, these numbers will be different in these segments. Uh, mm. uh, particularly, let's say SUVs compact and above is mm. being, uh, for example, have a tremendous impact due to Euro 6 and the mm -hmm. taxation. The taxation is close to 45, 48% plus for a SUV. There mm. versus a 5% EV will have a substantial cost, uh, 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 what I would say, parity. And those customers are the one who are maybe looking at contributing to the society and so on and so forth. And hence that segment will have a different cutoff uh, for EV on this. The right. mid segment like C and D segment cars right now uh, is uh, what we are talking about. Something like uh, 10 to 15 lakhs is very difficult to cut parity because even in Euro 6, less than 1.5 later mm -hmm. ends, uh, the, the cost have not substantially increased with after treatment and so on and so forth, while the EV still needs about 40 kilowatt hour battery and hence the parity is right now not there. And hence the mm -hmm. battery prices below 100 uh, will bring a little bit of parity around it in the personal segment. Small car segment, I think it, it needs a lot of efforts. I don't think small car will make sense on EV uh, for very long time, unless uh, policy intervention comes, unless the mm. FA norms comes into picture, and then you really have to impact that. Similar mm. case in buses. Buses is never going to be in cost parity with uh, high-Z engines. It has to be a uh, drive, and it has to be on, on this. And the new business models like leasing, like uh, per kilometer rate has helped. I think that is very important. The innovation should not be only on technology, but on the business model. Suddenly, right. if you look at uh, bus tenders, the per kilometer rate of EV is today lower than IC engines. Maybe right. Shant uh, will be able to talk about it on the tenders. It's because the new business model has come because the EVs can run 10 years without any problem because you don't have maintenance and IC engines need so many other maintenance issues. And hence, uh, innovation as a financing business model, leasing business model is going to drive that adoption. So that's how I would summarize that various segment has a different cutoff for parity when mm. uh, probably we can try leasing in small cars. Uh, that may uh, have a breakthrough in uh, parity when compared to IC engine. So that may help. Right. Uh, that's interesting, Mr. Babu. Thank you for setting uh, the context as far as greater adoption of EVs are concerned. And uh, even the e-commerce sector, I'll probably ask you to throw some light on it later on is going to uh, absorb a large number of three wheel three wheelers where uh, Mahindra Trio is a leader. But I'd like to get in uh, Mr. Tapan uh, there. Tapan, you would be hearing uh, Mahesh Babu speak about electric vehicles, what would be affordable in future. Uh, he had this view and I, I guess this is something that Maruti Suzuki also feel that, that a small car would be very expensive uh, for the common buyer because of the kind of investment, because of the cost of the lithium ion cell. Uh, so, from Maruti Suzuki's point of view, from your point of view, which segments of the industry will drive the growth of the EV sector? No, I think, uh, am I audible? Yeah. Yeah, I think what Maya said, uh, this is uh, what we keep discussing in Siam, and I think this is now the government's view also that, okay, the adoption is going to take place faster and faster, probably with uh, the public transport vehicles first, the buses, two wheelers, three wheelers fleets and then coming to personal cars. That's the hierarchy, how it is going to follow. And mm -hmm. uh, that, that's also the hierarchy in which the fuel consumption can be reduced for the country. Mm -hmm. So it serves both the purposes in terms of economics as well as in terms of the social responsibility that we have. Mm -hmm. Now coming specifically to passenger vehicles, I think uh, it's going to take a lot of time. Uh, unless you are running uh, 200 kilometers kind of a day, uh, which is kind of the fleet applications, it doesn't really serve the purpose today. Mm -hmm. uh, 
so uh, mai's rightly pointed out the uh, suv segment probably 12 15 lakh range of uh, customers who are buying that kind of a vehicle mm. may be able to put that delta factor for the electric vehicle and maybe okay. some of them will be able to buy but however we need to put that in the context all again uh, we should not be over simplifying the charging issue also mm. like how many people do really have a parking slot at home mm. or in a society where the parking sar uh, the charging can be provided if it is there perfectly fine we, you see new condominiums coming in you see new housing societies coming in where a good charging point can be put up Mm. If the, if those customers can afford these vehicles, the plus delta, whatever percentage, let's leave it aside. Mm. Then, of course, they are the first ones who can uh, take in terms of a personal vehicle. Mm. Besides the fleet, that's uh, that's I think I think we feel the similar way. And small cars is far far off. Mm. Now, just one more point I'd like to touch what Mahesh talked about. I think the import bill uh, has to be looked at in uh, two contexts: uh, today's context and then future context. What Mahesh talked about is that. when you are able to localize the sales in india then what is the kind of material will be bringing in that's perfectly okay if you are able to localize everything and do we only import few raw materials this situation will be very valid today's context probably things are very different which which needs to be done and therefore the focus on manufacturing ecosystem needs to be done uh, for promoting electric mobility in india right right uh, thanks apan i am going to come to uh, mr abdesh now uh, mr abdesh what do you think is going to work for india in terms of charging infrastructure battery swapping uh, there are several startups which are working in that space right now i think sun mobility is also one uh, in comparison to your regular charging stations uh, across the country what do you think is going to work and what would be possibly the ratio between battery swapping stations and uh, regular charging points yeah so again i'll start with that uh, you know right now we are doing the uh, four wheeler segment and in the four wheeler passenger vehicle segment we are of the view and we are convinced that the battery swapping is not going to work in the four wheeler passenger vehicle segment mm. uh, i mean and though there are uh, uh, you know esteemed panelists here from the oem side and they can you know probably uh, give more details on the four wheeler passenger vehicle side but on the two wheelers and three wheelers uh, we believe that yes in three wheelers probably because see battery swapping requires uh, standardization because what you are doing see essentially battery swapping uh, you are not doing the vehicle uh, cost down you know basically the, i mean i personally feel that this is this is a you know i would say a, a not a correct uh, way of representing that the vehicle price is going down because if you are taking out the battery so what you are doing the 50% of the cost of the vehicle mm. is being transferred to someone else you know without having the guarantee that these vehicles would necessarily come there you know mm. so i think you know it has to be seen in totality because even if the battery swapping operator is there unless they have the bandwidth that the same set of battery can serve to the different set of vehicles mm. it's not going to make any business sense mm. so if the oems continue to have the different set of vehicles which require a different form factor of the battery this is not going to serve the purpose you know whatever be the regulations this will not fly that's that's clearly mm-hmm. because we have done a pilot uh, in 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 noida and we are of the view that one set of battery is catering to only one set of the vehicles because other oems are having a different form factor of the battery mm-hmm. second we believe that in three wheelers and the two wheeler uh, delivery segments this can work because they have an incentive to keep their vehicles for the maximum time on the road so they will be much more comfortable you know doing in 3 minutes 4 minutes uh, swapping the battery and doing it but from the personal two wheeler segment again i personally feel, believe that you know we as an indians we we attach a very strong emotional value to our possessions you know and the vehicle is in a strong possessive item if mm. we get a scratch on our vehicle you know we get furious mm. there from the consumer sentiment point of view if i feel that you know i have i have purchased a 50000 worth vehicles to to and i am not sure which battery i am getting in is it the battery good how it will impact my vehicles so i think for the two wheeler segment probably the personal vehicles our view is that the battery swapping will not work mm. uh, the vehicle segment like three wheelers and the delivery in the two wheelers this will work because you can standardize the battery 
you can standardize mm. the form factor but then this can only work when you have a standardized the form factor otherwise you are passing on your uh, problem to someone mm. else in the ecosystem which will not which will not work so i think this is what i uh, uh, believe on the battery swapping okay now we have about 16 minutes left or uh, 14 minutes left and i'm going to take final comments from all our panelists uh, mr vijayanand uh, if i can begin with you uh, do you think india's uh, EV story, and I feel that it's already happening, will be led by various state governments. The center can play an enabling role. It can come up with a FAME 3 policy, which, which can encourage adoption further. But do you think eventually now it is the state governments which will have to drive it? We're seeing some very attractive policies coming from uh, Telangana, from Andhra Pradesh, from Karnataka, even Delhi for that matter. Yeah, uh, Parikshit, I think uh, both the central government and state government are at least making an effort to do the right things. Uh, Mahesh already alluded to the fact that, you know, it's all now for the industry to see how to put their business plans in place, how to make those investments that are necessary. Uh, maybe there are a couple of uh, areas where, like, for example, the charging, you know, the DISCOM facilitating charging model and, uh, you know, monetizing the charging infrastructure. A few few glitches there that could be sorted out, but purely from a supply chain capability perspective, uh, mm -hmm. the the support coming in from the government, including the ACC PLI, is a good start. We need mm -hmm. to be consistent with this policy, have a very clear, reliable, transparent mechanism that could work in favor of those who are making those investments, and mm -hmm. uh, uh, you know uh, you will eventually see. Uh, EV hubs, EV manufacturing, research and development hubs evolving, depending mm -hmm. upon which state government is grabbing the initiative and you know making it easy for the initial startup and the uh, you know four to five years of handholding that's required. Mm -hmm. uh, we did a financial modeling and we found that uh, you know at an EBITDA level, it's a very workable business case. The mm -hmm. challenge, at least till you scale up to a global Globally competitive level mm. is about the interest and the depreciation burden that the project will suffer. Mm. So, in my view, to, to, to kind of summarize, the demand is no longer an uncertain factor. Maybe it's a two years, three years here and there. I think mm. the entrepreneurial risk spirit should be able to factor that in. Uh, mm. the technology variability is kind of getting a little clarified now, but I think that's a challenge that station makers have to take fold it into it this but mm. the execution i think that's where it will you know from purely from a battery perspective relentless execution of your plans is what is going to make it work right uh, thank you uh, mr vijayanand uh, mr babu if i can also ask you tesla is going to come to india this year uh, possibly just with maybe two or three sales outlets initially there is a lot of excitement about that and i know of at least five state governments which are ready to roll out uh, the red carpet for Tesla to come in, set up some sort of R&D or manufacturing operations. Even though Tesla cars are going to be very expensive, what does it do for encouraging an EV ecosystem in India? Thanks, Parishit. I have already tweeted that uh, welcoming Tesla because uh, anybody who is getting go on, come into India, global players, Indian players, they are going to increase the pie and the awareness of electric uh, vehicles, which I'm talking about uh, to the consumers. So mm -hmm. there is enough space in India. And this only says that India is still in the radar of global players on electric mobility uh, based on the various policies government have done and also Indian players like us, Tata's and others who have invested on mm -hmm. electric mobility for the future. Mm -hmm. I think this is going to create a lot of attention towards India because India has been lacking on technology for hundreds of years now in the automobile we normally get five years later a Euro 6 which is introduced in Europe or Japan or US and then that we have been just adapting such technologies and suppliers used to say, send them from Germany and all that later on localized Mm -hmm. But I strongly believe EV is going to create a level playing field for all the countries. No mm -hmm. country is going to have an upper hand on technology because India is a um, very high, what I would say, uh, 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 very high of uh, human capital on IT and software. And EV vehicles are mainly 
integration of IT software with automobile together. Um, the uh, automobile ecosystem in India is very mature now, and the IT ecosystem is very, very what I would say at the at the leadership level. So if we merge both of both of them together, I think we can create a lot of innovative products on EV and new mobility, what I call as, uh, with uh, with uh, with a very profound presence across the globe. So this right. is, I would say, this decade is very, very important. And uh, we need to capitalize this decade for positioning India as a global player in mobility. And uh, this EV only opens up that chance. And I strongly believe we are at the start of the start and the story is yet to be written. And I'm sure many panelists and many more youngsters and startup are going to write the India story uh, when we all read 20 years later at, after our retirement. That's, that's what I will conclude with. Beautiful, nice words, uh, Mr. Babu. Mr. Mr. Arya, Mr. Nishant Arya, if I can uh, come to you now. You're you're a firm believer. You're a, you're very bullish about public transport. You said in previous interviews that the public transport sector buses will bounce back very soon, even though maybe uh, the the sale is a little low now. But when it comes to penetration of EV buses, electric vehicle buses in the public transport fleets across the country, that that is that is still quite low. What is your outlook for that? How can we encourage that uh, to a greater extent? No, I think uh, that encouragement will come now, and especially with the government's announcement in the budget with about 18,000 crores for 20,000 buses, I think they are considering a large part of it to go into a PPP mode, public-private partnership, uh, mm -hmm. which will be adopted by schools and for staff transportation and uh, for multiple other applications at airports and other things. So uh, that will give a good encouragement for companies as well as uh, now with the TCO coming down, uh, becoming the parity difference, uh, reducing substantially as we speak year on year between electric buses and, and other uh, BS6 buses. Definitely people are getting encouraged. Plus, I think another thing which is very important is that how uh, with every bus we are reducing about 350,000 liters of diesel and 1000 tons of CO2 and how uh, at a carbon uh, neutral level, how each individual is contributing at a public transport level. I think that is very important to uh, understand. And uh, clearly, uh, public transport has viability gap funding across the world because it is subsidized by every single municipal corporation or city uh, for the local citizens. So it is very, very important that uh, how the, every single citizen from each part of the society is using that public transport. How is that made affordable, safe and comfortable uh, here? And uh, along with that, the intangible benefit of the green transportation, in addition to the total cost of ownership really being which Mahesh touched upon earlier on, I think will be very important because the operating cost of electric bus is about one third of a conventional bus. So right. the maintenance, the number of moving parts reduced from about 1800 plus moving parts to about 18 moving parts in electric bus. Mm -hmm. So we understand that the, and the, it simplifies the whole process. The fatigue level for the driver goes down. The accidents can be reduced and minimized uh, substantially. The noise pollution mm -hmm. is reduced. So that's the kind of uh, habit uh, people, the passengers who are using electric bus do not want to use any other kind of bus. If that's the kind of service which is provided by corporates, by schools, uh, by cities, airports, mm -hmm. citizens, uh, I think they would be looking forward to it and that's the way to go. And mm -hmm. cities, because about 50% of buses are in the use for city transportation, uh, they, those will be the first to convert where the infrastructure requirements are limited within the city. And post that, uh, the intercity transportation will be picking up. So I personally feel that uh, in this decade, we should be able to look at about 50% plus public transportation converting to EV. Right. And my final questions now to uh, Tapan Sabu and uh, uh, Dr. Ariel. Uh, Tapan, one thing that is clear from this discussion that we still need greater awareness when it comes to electric vehicles, green technology. Uh, there are a lot of myths about range, about charging, uh, uh, about uh, the cost of ownership. Do you think there has to be a sustained awareness campaign at the level of the government, if the government wants to promote electric vehicles through subsidies by changing policy, it also needs to invest in uh, creating those awareness campaigns. 
Well, I think it has to be done um, by both, actually, the government and the industry. At a, at, a, at a larger public forum, larger government initiatives could be there. And also, as we progress in this decade, like everybody is saying, OEMs will also start doing it. Associations could start doing it. And it has to be a societal campaign. It cannot be a campaign by one person. All stakeholders can do their bit actually say that electrification is the way to go and like i said it's a means to an end and what is at end we must be communicating to consumers so that they are aware about the responsibility of carbon neutrality or reducing carbon footprint making sure that india is energy secure if we can all able to do that and pitch in i think that will serve a great purpose right uh, dr adrian just to uh, now sum up uh, your thoughts on what governments around the world need to do when it comes to uh, technologies, electric vehicle technology, green technologies, and greater promotion for the same. Thank you very much. Uh, look, I'm very, uh, uh, I very much enjoyed the hearing a uh, very detailed discussion of what's going on in India. So it's, a, it's, it's impressive and uh, I'm looking forward to hearing more about it in the future. And I think given what I've heard today, I think there's, there's, um, it, it's clear that uh, the range anxiety and uh, a range of um, uh, difficulties or, or gaps in information across the community are, are a problem. Uh, the technologies are um, mature. There are some supply chain issues. So, so I would say the governments need to uh, both, uh, as we discussed before, Dr. Tapan and others have said, agreed that we need information campaigns from industry and, and the government. Um, but I think there's also... Um, more practical things that can be done to remove barriers in the supply chain. So supply chain seems to be a concern for batteries. I like the urban mining concept. I think uh, things like that need to, um, that uh, Mahesh uh, talked about, I think that sort of stuff, uh, while in principle um, technologically uh, feasible, it's, uh, it's a massive coordination challenge. So governments need to uh, step in there and support, uh, you know, smoothing and, uh, and incentivizing these sort of um, uh, pipelines. I think the other thing that people didn't talk about much today, that's probably the, uh, the area that I'm most uh, personally uh, qualified in and interested in is, is the area of using EVs to support the rollout of renewable technologies, both at the home level and at the grid level. So, so one of the challenges is, as you know, um, with large-scale uh, rollout of uh, wind and solar technologies, and is is balancing uh, at multiple time scales. Both, you know, if the wind and solar aren't quite uh, there sufficiently uh, over a period of time, there's a gap, and also um, keeping the grid uh, stable and secure during um, various kinds of uh, critical events that do happen, like a transmission line or a power station's tripping. And so uh, a grid with a lot of uh, uh, wind and solar, uh, we don't quite know how to operate it. Um, uh, we, don't, we do know in, in, in theory, but in, in, in practice, we don't have the, all, all the tools yet. So one of the tools, of course, is storage. You know, if, and one of the reasons why electricity is so hard to manage and deliver is because traditionally it's not been storable. That's why we don't worry about as much about supply chain issues and, and reliability with things like oil and gas, right? Because you can store it and save it up a bit, and then you've got a resilient system. So EVs are part of this massive resilience um, uh, capability that will be rolled out. So I think it's very important in, in all these discussions not to forget that this thing is not just a, a vehicle for uh, use, uh, but it's also uh, has a significant additional value and uh, we don't really know quite how to calculate uh, this uh, additional value. There's discussion of value stacking and provide frequency control and auxiliary services and energy balancing and all that. So, so you've got this battery on wheels that um, needs to be incentivized and, and integrated into the whole uh, electricity ecosystem. And that's um, something that the government uh, of India and, and others, I think, need to um, put a lot of uh, momentum behind. Both R and D, there's some R and D um, and, the, and fundamental research uh, to be done. Even the, these optimization algorithms that we work on at, at my research um, institute, yeah. they, they don't yeah. quite exist. So there's a whole range of things that government can do there. So that would be something that I would add as, as a new um, angle to this discussion. 
Right. Uh, we've completely run out of time, but we'd like to thank all our panelists, uh, Mr. Vijay Nand, Abdej Jha, Nishant Arya, Mahesh Babu, Dr. Ariel, and Tapan Sahu. I think one thing is very clear. This decade is extremely important, in fact, in terms of uh, the adoption of electric vehicles, and also India's place in adoption of green technologies and manufacturing of EVs as well. With that, I hand it over to Mr. Rohit. Thank you, Mr. Parishad Lutra. I think it was a very well conducted session. All of us enjoyed thoroughly. Uh, with this, we close this session. Uh, there is a session and last session of today, today's uh, day uh, on noble mobility, which is on public transport, transportation. Mr. Jasmine Shah will be the guest of honor. He's uh, from Delhi government. So we look forward to all the delegates to stay tuned with us. So with this, we will have lunch at home break. Uh, Lunch at home break for 30 minutes. Thank you very much. Thank you, Pariksha. Thank you. Thank, Thank you, you so Pariksha. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Bye. 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 Bye.